Good Friday morning, guys. My name is Jerry Miller, and this show is Real Talk with Keith Smith. Thank you kindly for joining us. It's great to be with you from downtown Charlottesville on a show that airs on every social media platform known to mankind. Today's program features Quentin Beckham and QB, as we have uh, affectionately dubbed him on this network, is a behind-the-scenes guy that has his pulse on a number of stuff, a number of avenues of real estate, from um, closings to deals to, to inspections to commercial to residential to multifamily um, to coaching to being the... Um, owner of a handful of businesses locally. He's got some perspective to offer. Keith Smith, his business and his team at Yes Realty Partners are absolutely on fire this year. I mean, we are, uh, ooh, the sound effect. That was good. God, I love you. That was fantastic. I appreciate that. Well, you know, it's my start of my second cup of coffee. So, it's so is that kick, what that was? It's kicking okay. in. It's okay. starting to kick in. That was, um, I that assumed was, you'd sprung a leak. Well, that too, probably. <laughs> that was a sound effect from Keith Smith. It was not him springing a leak or releasing or passing any kind of gas of any kind. You know, at a certain age, you never know. I, that's why I have to make sure I let that the, the viewers and listeners know, Quinn. Yeah, I feel like we're, we're treading into dangerous territory. We got, okay, let's talk market really? right here. We'll go straight into the territory that folks are wanting to know. And you, viewer and listener, can shape the discussion today by asking us questions. Quit, where do you want to begin? The first quarter is over, and there is no sign of slowdown. Well, it depends on how you judge slowdown. You know, um, if you look at sheer number of sales, there's still just a very limited Im inventory. So more choice today than there was a month ago and a month before that. But in total, the inventory is still less. And so although we've had buyers drop out of the market, we still have a lot more buyers than we do homes to sell them. And depending on the home and its particular setup, there's still a lot of competition. And by slowdown, um, he's exactly right. I meant the, uh, the chaos of multiple offer, home inspection waiver, appraisal gap, 30-minute um, stack showings. I mean, we, we talked about on Wednesday and Monday how open houses are being canceled before the open houses even happen. We have homes going under contract 10 minutes after the coming soon period is over and the listing is active. I mean, gentlemen, this is peak COVID all over again. I don't think so. You don't I, I want to so. disagree. Okay, please, because, please. You know, we often confuse the economy and the market as though they're the same thing. Okay, please. So when we talk about big numbers in real estate, we're talking about the economy. Inventory is really low. Prices are not climbing like they used to, but they're not really going down either. They're staying pretty steady. And in particular areas, you have a lot of competition. Um, and that's the economics of real estate. But within the market, there's still a lot of granularity. So I just, I want people to recognize that although we talk about the economy and the market like they're the same thing, they're not. They're, they may live in the same forest, but they're very different beasts. And so depending on where you're looking for the house, what house you're listing, where it's located, the kind of house it is and the price point, you may not be experiencing some of these things that we're talking about. And in this case, that market really goes back to what we say all the time, that all real estate is local. And I think there's, there's some need for education based on the specifics of the house mm -hmm. and what the level of competition is for that area and that style of house and that price point that you can only get from a realtor that knows your local market that is really enmeshed in what's going on in the neighborhood where you want to sell. Hey, Smith, jump in here. So trusted advisors matter. We, we've been talking about that long enough. And to, uh, to Quinton's point, mark, micro markets matter. And we've been talking about this for some time, right? You know, um, I mean, look, I, I've got permission to talk about it. We, we put a listing on uh, 125 Gristmill Drive late last night, uh, right location, right price. Where's that at? Uh, it's in Mill Creek. Um, so it's the right location, right price. Um, the features are great on it. On it um, and I am pretty much full with today. Hit the market late last night. I'm full with today with showings. There we go. On, on that. Now, if that home was to Quinton's point, if that home was someplace else, I may not have the full thing. So, you know, I, I, the, the, I think that the differential between, let's say, the COVID. Peak COVID. Peak COVID was everything was like, like this right now you need to know your local market and need to know where do we not have this kind of movement in the car footprint 
Hmm. Where do well, we one, have any, this kind of momentum? One of the things he mentioned that I want to highlight is, is that key phrase, right price. Yeah. Because that's one of the ones we're really struggling with now. Because okay. if you're not really sitting down with an expert that you trust, it's really easy to forget that it's not last year or that maybe you're not in a particular location or a particular style of house and price point and overprice it. And in this market, price is something that people are really, really digging into and being very comparative about. So if you are too high on the market right now, you're going to suffer for it oh. in a way that's much more extensive than it would have been a year or two years ago. Okay, there we go. And so, so I specific. think when we talk about granularity, that, that price point that you, that you posted at is, is paramount to your success. And we've always talked about it like that. It's just that if it was... 40% of your success three years ago, it's going to relate to 60 to 70% of your success today because with the inventory so long, it's really easy, so low, it's easy to draw comparisons. Mm -hmm. And moving out of a price point where you belong means you lose all your buyers. All your demographics won't see you because in the houses they're looking at that are in their price point, you're not there. And the buyers who are looking at you are looking at other houses that are appropriately priced for that price point and they're going to those. So of my famous six that I talk about all the time, number two is pricing, right? Number one is location, two is, is pricing. Pricing matters regardless of, of the market and you need to get it right. Um, I've also got permission from Yvonne and Houston to talk about the win we did in, in Richmond. Oh, viewers and listeners, you followed this story here. It's, uh, it's time for you to hear how this played out. Yeah, so, so we were, uh, uh, let me see, we, it was listed at 475 and This and is Richmond. Correct. And Shore Pump, closer to Shore Pump? No, clo closer, closer to the Willow Lawn, actually. Okay, Willow Lawn. On, on that end of it. But back to the po price point was, in this particular marketplace, in that micro market, we were losing deals $100,000, $150,000 over list price. Very specific. You move two or three blocks over to Quinton's Point, Ah, the complete opposite. So the price ma matters on that end of it. And, you know, how we ended up winning the day was we encouraged, we, we, in, we, we used uh, Woody Fincham's help, right? And we went and started digging into recent sales and recent pendings so that we could go ahead and put on the table the best price that we felt that would work. And we won, uh, won the day on that one, which the kids are super excited Mrs. Smith is even more excited because grandbaby number three is going to be within an hour. So, so 13 deals, 13 we offers. Lost, we lost, thir that, this was the 13th one. We yeah, won the they made 13 one. offers. He's got a, a daughter and he's got a son-in-law moving from Seattle to Virginia. They're doing that for his job. He's a doctor, mm -hmm. Richmond area. Mm -hmm. 13 offers. They connected on the 13th. Tell us the mechanics of the deal. Yeah, so, you know, and, and the mechanics of the deal was really trying to keep the buyer, in this case, my daughter. Home inspection? So, no, yeah, no, we waived home inspection. Okay. Yeah. Appraisal gap? Uh, yes, but I don't think we're going to need it. Okay. Because we did our homework and we were able to prove that the home will, will hopefully appraise for what the ultimate contract price was. And I don't want to get too much into that because the deal isn't closed yet on, okay. on the actual Plus price. Plus 475 though. It is a substantially over list. Yeah. Um, but we did our homework, right? And there's recent closings that are on that block that will happen in the next week or so that I know will support the contract price. So I don't think we'll actually pull the trigger of an actual appraisal gap on it. I think we're actually going to make it work. I'd love to weave Quentin into the conversation here. How, explain to us how the market can move in such a short period of time that listings can can come on the market at a 475 in this particular case and potentially close six figures above where they started. And I understand the market can move and I understand some comps are dated, but is this an underpricing strategy or is the market really moving that fast? Well, one, I think there is a strategy no matter what the market is doing. And when you price too high, you pay for it more extensively than if you price a little bit under. Pricing a little bit under will always bring more buyers to the table and always give you more leverage. Pricing over will always chase people away and reduce your leverage because you're asking for everything right up front in the advertisement and in the marketing. So that's one thing that's true no matter what. 
<clears throat> the second thing I'll point out is that these scenarios are exceedingly granular. Um, the median home price in Virginia went down $5,000 in March. Mm -hmm. For the first time in seven years, it went down. And so, now that's a median, so there's 50 above and 50 below, so half the homes didn't go down 5,000 and maybe increased, and half went down by more, but you're seeing this granularity, and it's still based on a supply and demand, it's just that the supply and demand is no longer consistent across all counties, all markets, all neighborhoods, and all venues. So where you're at, as Katie Pearl was mentioning online, is exceedingly important Absolutely. to what that strategy is for your house. This is Katie's comment. I think listings, and Katie's an agent, I think listings that are not in established neighborhoods are not moving as quickly. <clears throat> so, you know, if, if we want to compare, we sold 24% fewer homes in March than we did a year ago in March. That's so a that's, lot. <clears throat> and bringing it down to like 8,700 homes, roughly. The last time March sales totals were under 9,000 was 2016. So it's not just that it's a drop in comparison to pandemic levels. It's beyond that. It's beyond that. It's a big drop in inventory. So when you're in a really desirable neighborhood, that drop in inventory or a really desirable location because of work and school, um, that low inventory has a bigger effect on raising your price and creating competition because you have a greater demand for that location, whereas when you're outside of those locations, the pressure of economy and price drops is, has a greater effect than, than the other. That's good stuff right there. So, so can I, uh, Judah, uh, can you, is it too much to ask you to throw some of those one, one through six um, slides up? Can you, can, you can you work on that, sir? I've got them ready to go. Oh, you're, you're a good man. So that's, good why, man. that's why number one nice. is my number one slide is, is important. It's is that, do you want that on, on screen? Yes, sir. I'm oh, sorry. it is on screen. Oh, he's got it on screen. Look at that. He speaks Keith, too. That's good. Number now, one slide. If, if, right. only, if only Keith would understand Keith. The right location. This would be a great <laughs> The director thing. did. Yeah, so, so to Quentin's point and, and Katie's point and to the conversation we had about Richmond and moving over to a couple of different locations, this is why number one is always the location. Number two is the price, right? And to, to uh, you know, and that's kind of where you start on these two things. Where's my location and where's my price? And if it's overpriced for a location... You will sit. It won't sell. It won't get shown on that end of it for the most part. Um, you know, you, the features and the conditions and all that kind of great stuff on the other items, uh, you know, won't even come into place if it's not in the right location and not priced right. Carly Wagner, I'll get to your comment here in a matter of moments. Um, Deep Throat, we'll get to some of your comments here on Twitter. I got uh, <laughs> don't ask. Don't LinkedIn, ask. yeah, it's no, don't ask. Deep Throat. It's, <laughs> watches constantly. Deep Throat is an influencer in this community, and I'll leave it at that. Um, let me go to Carly's here. I think Carly is on your team. She works for the broker, yes. Okay. Um, thoughts, thoughts on revised loan level price adjustments that penalize larger down payments, higher credit scores. Does this make mortgage markets riskier Will it actually help with home ownership and equity as reportedly intended? Who wants to tackle this? This is now in the news. You brought this up yesterday, and it's all over social media right now. Do so it's the new Biden this? rule. Yeah, that, do we wanna, um, we should describe it. Set the stage first. Set the so table. One, we don't have a whole lot of detail. So what we have is a, a three-sentence sound Essentially bite. a headline. Yeah, it's a yeah, headline. It's a headline. We, so we don't have a whole lot of detail. Yeah. Um, the, the baked down version in the headlines, which I have no way to verify, so I'm just going off of what they're reporting, is that if you're in a better credit situation with down payment and a good credit score, and you're working through a Fannie Mae or federal loan product, then you will have about $40 per 400,000, maybe per month, I wasn't clear on that, tacked on to your mortgage payment that will then get moved to low credit folks to help change and lower their, their interest rate. So that if you're getting 6% because you've got a big down payment and a great credit score, the person down at the bottom of that credit score with less down payment also participating in a federal program will have access to that money so that maybe instead of them getting 8%, 
they're getting seven. Um, and I have no real intelligent commentary on it because a lot of this stuff is in the details. You know, how it works, how it's being applied. Um, and and I, I, I think, although this is an interesting scheme to think of, um, I'm not sure that it would address anything that we talk about when we talk about affordable housing with a capital A. I, he set the stage perfectly. I mean, yeah. that's exactly what it is. Basically, in a nutshell, if you guys want to have a talking point for the weekend cocktail party, the president, it's the Biden rule is what we're calling this, and it's not us, but the national media, will is attempting, or I guess he's doing this, will redistribute high-risk loans to homeowners with good credit. So this basically, is this is basically, uh, this is the, I saw this, I think, on a corner in Manhattan. It yeah, was on a cardboard cool. box. There's <laughs> some shells and a little ball underneath it. And it was just moving the stuff around. Yeah. Uh, so actually, this hit, came across my feed yesterday. Um, a lot of trusted folks that are watching was asking me this a question. I put a bit of a pause on it until Wednesday because I want to do a little bit more research to, to Quentin's point, and I want to ask Scott Morris. Okay, Ross you know, Mortgage, Scott Morris. Uh, so th so got those a couple who, loan officers watching. So here. those who are well, they can they can chime in way better than us at this LO, point. Do you want to offer perspective on at, this at this point? But to make a long story short, um, it, it is based on first readings that that's basically what they're going to be doing. They're going to, it's going to cost anywhere between $40 per month, and if you've got an excellent credit score and so forth and so on, you know, in essence, you're going to get penalized for it, to be honest with you, uh, on it. But look, I've been doing this a long time. What the government says it's going to do and actually how it gets implemented is a very long that's run, very fair. <laughs> wrong runway that's very fair. On, on that end of it. But I, I want to have an expert come in and say, okay, what does this really mean? And how does this really impact the market? Or doesn't it? And, um, you know, I, I'll, I'll, I'll straight up. Uh, Alex well, I mean, Carly straight up said, does it have any impact on affordability? Well, does this actually make home ownership more affordable or do anything to <clears throat> inequity in home ownership? The answer is probably, and I don't know. <laughs> because until we see how it's implemented and what effect it makes, Every change in interest rate makes a big difference in your payment. And depending on what your income to loan payment ratio is, a smaller change could make a big difference for those people individually. So I, I don't really know, because again, this is a statement of a rule that's probably proposed as opposed to enforced. And then there's all of the detail of how it's going to work and how are people going to know. And I think. Um, so it's a regulatory biggest. thing. The Biden administration has the authority to do this. I've been doing this for 36 years, and I know this much. I bet you they have not figured out what the unintended consequences are of, of, of this action. They, they really, you know, at this point, this could be just a fly on the wall, what this is what we're thinking, and we need to really understand what, what impl implications, you know, I can't even say the words. Speak Keith for me, will you? Yeah. Implications. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, has on it. But uh, I can assure you, somebody thinks that this is going to help housing affordability, will it or not, is yet to be determined. I mean, this seems, this seems just like uh, the window dressing. Remember, was it like six, eight months ago, the mortgage headline was... Uh, was it the 40-year mortgage was the headline? And then what was the other headline that got everybody all up in arms? The Bank of America one. With like uh, oh, yeah. the Detroit the, the Detroit jurisdic jurisdiction. It was, uh, what was the headline? Do you remember? It, 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 was, it was in essence a similar type of scenario. It just had like this, it was fear-mongering. And it got folks all up in arms here. We're talking about this Biden rule. And if you have good credit and you uh, put some money down, evidently you're going to pick, pick up some of the risk slack for folks looking to buy homes that are riskier candidates. So that's why I like what we do here, long format. Let's do a little bit of research. Let's make sure we clearly know what we're talking about. Get Scott Morse in the mix. Before we do that, get the professionals in to talk about it. But that's why, you you know, headlines are headlines. It's supposed to generate what we just did to yeah. talk about it. Um, all right, so how, how about this question for uh, Quentin Beckham from Spotify. Uh, Jonathan for the panel says, can you ask um, 
the, uh, the new panelists what his thoughts are if the summer is going to bring more homes for sale. I think you're going to see the peak during spring. I agree. Uh, you know, if, uh, it feels like we are returning, and I, I could be wrong. It feels like we're returning to a more seasonal market as opposed to what we had in the past where we bumped up and we stayed there by and large. And so I, I would imagine you're getting back to the double camel hump that we're used to in our locality where you have the spring bump, then you get a fall bump, but the fall bump is less than the spring bump. So I, I follow week over week. So just to answer that question, we are, we are down this Friday compared to last Friday on new that come in. Not, not, not a lot, a few, about seven units on it, but it's interesting, the pendings this week versus last week is up 81%. There's 56 more that went in pending as of today versus the same week last, last week. So I think Quentin is 100% right. I think the spring has sprung. I think personally, I think you're going to see the summer take a little bit of a dip on it, but I don't think pendings are going to slow down at all. John Blair on LinkedIn. Hello and what's up? Welcome to the program. Twitter, jump in the mix. Um, I'm happy to relay questions on Twitter. Um, we have Caitlin Peltzer watching over on Twitter. This question to you, um, Quentin Beckham, more difficult now to buy a house more versus peak COVID to buy a house? We love that question on this show. And I'll, I'll, I'll set it the always table. Depends, it always depends on who you are and what you're looking for. More expensive inventory now. Again, that really depends on where you're looking. Okay. Medium price drop 5,000, which, which when we know some houses are selling for 100 grand over list, means some houses pricing has really come down mm -hmm. in order to keep that median at 5,000. And so to make a blanket statement, um, would be misleading. Are there places people were gonna, are going to look where it's more difficult, not because of prices, but because of interest rates? Absolutely. Are there other places where that's not true? Absolutely. Interest rates 2x versus this time last year? Roughly, uh, yes. You know, we're what, three low threes versus, was it now on a 30 fix? Um, Six and change? Yeah, about six. Six Scott and a half, and some, would, something like change. that. I, yeah. I just, I just know this because I we locked in with the kids. Um, so you're in the mid six. So mid you're two x the rate. In some cases, year over year, your double digit value increase. Your purchasing power has gone down, and uh, the house is more expensive in the Tony coveted areas. Yeah, I'm actually just looking at green at the moment on what the what the quarter over, you know year to date versus year to date changed in the the the, va the value because I think I think what you're going to see to Quinton's point some of the areas that are out and I think Nelson will be one of them I think you're going to see those prices kind of stabilize or go down a little bit but in the city and the Almar County and say Lake Monticello we're looking at at increases so I'm just curious of what the 639 Kevin Yancey in Waynesboro says we're at right now with decent credit thank you Kevin for letting us know there um, that the, uh, the the 30 year fix Quentin I'll get you in the mix on a, a question from YouTube for you and Keith you as well yes sir um, with potentially more inventory coming on as Quentin said in the spring um, which is now I think I think which we're, is right now I think we're at the peak I think the, the they say the peak of homes coming on nationwide I think was the four, the 17th of, of April if you read dig into dig into the data so the question is is that across all spectrums does the guest think across all spectrums what do you mean by spectrum by spectrums uh, yeah I, I think I think you're gonna see some of the lower prices because of the interest rates just making it hard maybe slow down a little bit the upper end it just depends on how much cash everybody has to bring <coughs> bring to the table um, I can tell you a uh, quarter year to date year to date in Green County um, the uh, sales price went up um, fifty thousand dollars that's roughly thirteen percent so if you would have bought a home in Green County single-family detached no new construction in uh, the beginning of last year, you went up roughly 13%. The, uh, five That's medium. Pearl certification at their office watching the program. Hey. Carol Thorpe 
watching the program um, as we speak right now, the queen of Jack Jewett. Um, Quentin, do we think with this market that uh, the back half of the year is going to bring anything different, or is it going to be much of the same? Yeah, you know, it's really hard to predict mm -hmm. that far in advance. So um, positives that we've seen is, is mortgage rates beginning to really embrace decoupling from what the feds are doing with rates. You're also seeing a very, very strong job market persist and strong wages. So I know when we talk about housing affordability and the affordability index, uh, price and mortgage rates have a lot to do with that, but so does median income. And median income still remains strong. And the jobs reports says that even if you do lose a job or you're laid off, you have to leave for some reason, the amount of time you're gonna be without work is, is much shorter. So things in the last half of the year that we're still watching, um, you know, the, the trend line is still inverted for yields. And we don't like that. That has been one of the best predictors of a recession. We're not seeing a lot of volatility in markets where we would expect. And the only place that we're really concerned is commercial that's non-industrial. So as in terms of residential market, we're carrying forward all of the negatives we had last year, but they're not as bad as they used to be. You know, they're less Freddy Krueger and more poltergeist. And so, so a little less directly frightening. And we're maintaining a really strong jobs market with good wage growth. And so if, if you're comparing to what was the competition level for buyers a while back, it still looks better in total. And although we are a little bit less affordable year over year, it's not as dramatic for us in the Mid-South or the South as it is in a lot of other markets in the country. The 1980s and A Nightmare on Elm Street with reference. Freddy Krueger get a wow. reference today. Wow. On Real Talk with Keith Smith. Uh, yeah. The, that I have is, to go uh, back to shows I know. You know, I'm that so is, out on pop culture nowadays. That, ladies and gentlemen, often comes with the Oracle of, Be of Belmont. An Elm, uh, A Nightmare on Elm Street reference. I love it. Freddy Krueger. <coughs> Look at you. L look, uh, it... The locations matter, I, and the micro locations matter, and I think everything that Quentin is trying to talk about makes it, makes a difference. And I'm I'm trying to take a look at Nelson County just the curiosity to see where we're doing quarter over quarter. I will tell you as I'm diving into our local numbers, most of the jurisdictions, most of the localities, are kind of climbing in value, much later, much less than they were last year, right? Percentage wise, for sure. Right, some in the single digits, a couple cr climbing up to the double digits. But you know, to be 70, I'm speaking of Greene County, to be 72 percent off in sales, that there's 72 percent less homes that sold in this quarter or the year to date versus last year. That's where the real story is. Um, I, I don't know how Quinton feels about that, but I think that's putting so much pressure on the market because there's just not enough coming on uh, to go ahead and do this. So how, how do you feel about the, the decrease in the volume of sales? How is that impacting the market overall? So this is where we're talking about granularity again. Yeah. So um, let's suppose we have the exact same house in Greene County versus city of Charlottesville. <clears throat> you put it on for the appropriate price. They're in the same condition and the difference is location. That difference in sales that we're seeing will affect the number of buyers that come to the table, the amount of competition you have, and that's that granularity that we're talking about. Um, I'm not surprised, particularly in counties that were traditionally lower sales volumes, and we saw this big bump during the pandemic because suddenly they had a value to their home that they had not experienced before. We sold a bunch of those out. You saw Green and Nelson sometimes four times as much volume and number of transactions as they had had traditionally in the past. Because people could work remotely. They had this like restart on life. Maybe it was like some kind of life crisis. Or it was a second home somebody yeah. bought. Who knew? But right. the economy really powered that. The pandemic powered that. For sure. Um, and that's that means stopping. We, we burnt through a lot of the sort of built up inventory mm -hmm. in a lot of these areas, much in the way we have in the metro centers and the more populated counties. And it's, it shows a little more dramatically because the total volume of numbers has always been lower in the outlying counties versus internally. You know what, when it comes down to it, 
you guys are the experts. I just sit here and learn from you. I, I, I'm very curious to see how the market manages this. The families that locked in an interest rate that's super low at a value a couple years ago, three, four years ago, that was much different than today's values. A much more affordable price point a handful of years ago at an interest rate that was much lower. It's going to be very difficult for those of us that have that to give it up. And I, and I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm sure that the 3%, 2% is having a negative impact on inventory, right? That being said, most people move for other reasons. Right? We understand that. Right. And, and if you've got to move, then you've got to move, right? That's the reason why the pendings are 81% higher week over week. These are folks that had to move regardless of it. And I, I, I'll throw this to, to Quentin. Uh, in the trenches, people are not talking about interest rates anymore. They're talking about you know where they where they can buy at what price they can buy for what their monthly payment is going to be, which is directly connected to interest rates, of course, on that end of it, and what's going to fit their families or persons or whatever need that they may have at that moment. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had an eighty-one percent jump week over week. Eighty-one fifty-six more people in the last seven days put homes well, on rates the rates have gone down. They were cheaper two weeks ago. I can tell you that much. Than they are than they are now. Week over week over week they went down. Two weeks ago that that that's a fair point. Yeah, well the the reality of it, I don't think interest rates are impacting that. These no, are, I agree with you. I agree with you. These are folks that have to buy for whatever for whatever reason. Your but, client's watching the program and is giving you an, an endorsement. Um, Carol Thorpe, she no, says, Jerry, this week I'm doing my part to help with the low housing inventory by putting a two bedroom, one bathroom ranch house in Mill Creek on the market for just under $300,000. Keith is my trusted advisor and realtor. Your viewers may contact him if interested. Just that, me a promise. Yes, thank you, thank you. A relationship uh, birthed through this talk show. Yeah, without a doubt. What about, thank you, Carol, for the kind, for the kind, for the kind words. Um, you know, we love what we do, right? We love helping people. We wake up every morning. Quentin wakes up every morning and goes, oh, my God, i got to talk to Smith today, right? And, um, uh, but we love what we do. We love, uh, I, 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 Ca Carol, I won't, I, I won't, I'll paraphrase the text I got from Carol last night. Um, I'm almost going to tear up talking about it. Um, it, what her, she sent me is why I do what we do every day. And this is not about money. This is not about interest rates. This is not about this. This is about helping a family move from step A to step B. And the text that I got from her li literally brought tears to my eyes. And that's why we get up and help everybody every day. You know, I talk about this all the time. You know, we wake up, Quentin and I wake up, we get to help people with one of the three best Three important things that are required. I'll screw it up. I he's know. Smiling, I knew it. He's I knew smiling, it. I knew and I it. screwed it up. Once I smiled at him, he screwed up the I line. I screwed it up. Damn it. This is the line. This is the hero line. This is the hero line, this and I the hero screwed line. it up. On, let's do this again. Uh, let me Quinn, try this again. Uh, Keith, why do you love what you do? Hello, Jerry. How are you today? <laughs> <laughs> what do you? Why do you love? Me? Oh, I've just screwed it up. Help me out here. Just save me. Save me, Quentin. <laughs> Oh, I get it. Geez. So one of the reasons I get to wake every mor wake up every morning that excites me. <laughs> Stop it. I'm going to screw it up. Oh, man. <laughs> I get to help people with one of the three things that's required to, for a trip around the sun. Stop looking at me. Trip around the sun. Which is, what is it? Food, clothing, and shelter. And you're in the shelter. I'm in the shelter I business. Stop smiling at me. God, he's you're in the, the basement of Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Yeah, there, there he is. There yeah. he is. He's part of it. I'm he's in the basement for a lot of reasons, my friend. That Man. Um, <laughs> no, seriously. All, all, all kidding aside. Carol, your house, all kidding aside, Carol, your house is going to go under contract. Yeah. And, you and, got uh, a fantastic um, trusted advisor in Keith. Uh, Mill and, Creek is a phenomenal location. And a two bedroom, one bath, under three hundred thousand. Good God! And the condition that yours is in, which is great, is a gem. It's a gem in this market. That all, type of that type of house doesn't exist in the urban. All range. those things are true, but 
what made the difference was the text I got from her last night. Because we helped her renovate the house. We helped her do all, the, all that work. And um, to, to, to receive the text that I did is exactly why we do what we do. It's and why you hire a trusted advisor to help you. There you go. Keller Williams' finest, Keith Smith. Ladies and gentlemen, he can deliver the hero line. He can remodel a house. He can sell a home. It was just fun. And then you'll have a martini at Tavola with you in the evening. Um, all right, quick. We, we got to get to his shirt here. By, I, uh, I at think some point. before we do that, okay. Um, I had something I wanted to say. When, when we talk about housing affordability, we we sort of do it in. Thank you for doing that, by the way. What? Thank you for saying housing affordability. Is oh, like you're affordable welcome. Housing. Uh, we're often talking about compared to sometime in the last four years. And, and I just want people to realize that when you take income, price, mortgage rate, and you start to map that out over 20 years, because you mentioned the 80s and I mentioned Freddy Krueger, housing is still more affordable today than it was when your parents and grandparents bought a house. Because mortgage Explain rates were that. lower. Because it's a, it's a product of the value of the dollar versus how much you earn. You know, um, I remember my parents being excited about their $35,000 a year job because it felt like a lot of money, one of them anyway, um, because pricing was so different. So, you know, typically we like housing because inflation runs one and a half to two and a half percent. Housing, if you map it over 40 years, gains at a steady curve of 3%. Even when it bumps up over that and then, then price corrects down, it, it hangs on a trend line of about 3%. So nationwide. It's nationwide. So that stays a good investment. I'm not saying there are not people that individually get a loss on a house. And average income compared to inflationary value, if you go back in time and you make it $20, $23, housing is still in one of the top four most affordable times in the last 40 years. And a lot of that has to do with the strong job market, strong earnings growth, and the ability of people to access loan products that, were, that are just better than what they used to be able to access. So in your individual house search, it may feel overwhelming. Don't give up. This is, still, this is still a good time to own a home. Homes are still going to do better than most of the economy. And although you know, I'm not in love with where I see our economy heading, it's a lot less scary than it was three months ago and six months ago. Oh, 100 percent. What aren't you in love of, in love with? Out of curiosity, because we still have, uh, you know, they have a control of the inflation that worries you. Inflation is a lot better though. Yeah, it's come down an entire point, sure. percentage point. Yeah. Now most of that is related to used car prices dropping and gasoline coming down. Yeah, I think if you groceries apart, are still high, yeah. and there was one other that was still pretty high that I can't remember off the top of my head. I think it was fuel, right? Do they pull? Do they pull off grocery mm. and fuel out of it? Those numbers. But, get both of, but I don't remember Got the specifics. Fuel was down, used car sales were down, and that made it the biggest impact on that overall one percent drop. If you're going to go buy eggs and milk, that's still pretty high in comparison, and probably won't change anytime soon. So, the but the value of your dollar, the amount of money you earn, and that overall value compared to your living circumstances, no matter who you are is significantly better than it was 10, 15, or 20 years ago. So although individually it may feel overwhelming, your opportunity and your overall housing prospects um, are just as good or better than if you were trying to buy a house in 2010, 2005, 2015, many of those times because we didn't have the strength of job market and earnings that we do today. So I'm gonna put a personal pin in that. We talk about my first house I bought all the time. What was the interest rate? 18. 18%. I just, plugged, 18. I just plugged it into an amortization table, right? So this was in 1988. I paid 18%. It was a $150,000 house. I put $25,000 down to buy it. A loan, my loan was $125,000. My P&I was $1,900 a month. And that didn't, didn't include taxes and insurance. Now, taxes weren't as high as they are now. Insurance probably wasn't that high. We had HOA fees and all that stuff. So we were paying north of $2,000, you know, and we weren't making the money we're making now. I can assure you that. So at that time, it was, we, were, we were at well above 50% of our income 
to pay for a home to go way above 50% of it. And we made that decision to do that. And thing we talk about all the time, we refinance it a couple of times, did very well when we sold it on the home, and we just kind of moved up the income ladder. We moved up the, the housing ladder as we, we kind of moved up. So to, to Quentin's point, you know, we were, we were struggling to make mortgage payments, but we knew it was the right thing to do to build equity and build uh, generational wealth. Um, Katie has this comment. I'm friends with the folks um, that have the, uh, the low interest rates and got the houses at the good prices at the, at the beginning of COVID. This is Katie Pearl. They are okay, they, they are okay with giving up their 2.5% rate, but they need to have options of places to go. And right now it feels like they don't exist, which only perpetuates the problem because they don't want to list their home until they know where they are going. So we talked, I think it was Monday. You did. You brought it up. It was, was it Monday we talked about this? I'll throw it to Quentin. I mean, if you have a domino deal and you need to buy a new place, you need to sell your house to buy a new one. Is the strategy in today's competitive market, list your house now, sell, before you go under contract with the other one with the caveat of the domino? I think, I think there's, again, there's so much granularity in that right now, it's hard to have an overriding answer. Everybody's circumstance is different. And so how you map their trip from point A to point B is going to vary a lot. I do think part of what is tamping down our inventory is that a lot of people that want to move but don't have to move are sitting tight with the mortgage rates that they've got. There is an opportunity as we continue to go through, I'll call it a price correction for lack of a better word, although it's probably not as dramatic as that sounds. As we continue to move forward in time, I think the opportunity for interest rates to level out or continue dropping and price to come down as well might moderate some of that. It's a harder market to do today that in, especially if you're wanting to move to the same neighborhood. The domino deal. Yeah. I, w I want to get back to the domino deal in, in a minute because we actually are doing that in Richmond. The, um, the buyer, the seller, we've agreed they, they need to stay in their home we've agreed up to 60 days so they can find something to buy. They need to close, get the money, just everything we talked about, they need to close. That market is insane where they're at at the moment on that end of it. Location matters, micro markets matter. Are they staying in the market? The yeah. sellers, yeah. they are? Yeah. So, Quentin, if Scott is right, Mr. Morris is right, and we get to around 5% by the end of this year, is that gonna make this worse? make it better? Is it going to free up some inventory? What do you think? I think it'll help a ton. Um, you know, we're already feeling the world come around to the idea that, you know, interest rates last year were sort of a once in a lifetime thing. This is more normal. If you get down to five with the price compression we're seeing in most areas and across the country, that will change the entire picture. The other big deal that, that really drives this is consumer confidence and their ability to move. Katie brought up a consumer that's, confidence That's point. exactly right. I need to sell my house for X, but I'm concerned about where, where I will go. That's totally a consumer confidence issue. Um, and at some point, you know, you have to stop dating and pop the question and, and move forward. And it's personal circumstances that decide that and overcome it. A drop down to 5% by the end of the year, as Scott's predicting, will make a huge change in the ability of sellers and Getting buyers off that to fence. tolerate however much risk. And okay, so you're saying a drop will get more inventory, potentially, because it creates confidence in the consumer, I get that. It also creates a deeper buyer pool, because it, 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 it uh, expands would purchasing hope. power. One would hope. And yeah. that deeper buying pool with expanded purchasing power makes it even more competitive. And remember, in the last three years, a lot of our excess buyer and inventory product is burned. And unless there's a compelling personal reason, somebody that bought a house last year isn't going to buy another one for five or six years. And all the trends are people are, before the staying pandemic, longer, yeah. the trends were that people were staying longer in their houses than they used to. And that's a trend that will probably continue. I agree with that. Uh, and, and the inventory is not going to get any better. I, I don't want to get too much into the weeds on the Albemarle County Board of Supervisors that I spoke to that was at. 20%? Talked about that yesterday too. It's no the the if that ordinance gets adopted as it is structured right now, there will be no more new development in Albemarle County. You talk about it with Quentin. I, I have not talked about Quentin, but I will tell you 
uh, we, Ned Galloway, hats off to him and some conversations mm -hmm. I had with, with uh, Board of Almar County Board of Supervisors. They've agreed to do a work session and bring in folks from the from the bring in folks from car bring in real estate agents bring in developers thank god and they're going to do it under the auspices of the regional housing partnership which some guy is part of over here on that's the table. you on the table what's your role with them keith uh I, I i used to be chairman now they kicked me out made me vice chair they were tired of seeing my face so for uh, those that don't know what we're talking about and and a good outline of this is on the free enterprise forum neil williamson wrote about this very much so. um i'll give it to you in a nutshell, this is very simplistic. The spitball conversation with Albemarle County government leadership, new development moving forward in Albemarle County to try to breed affordability, 20% of new development earmarked for sale or for rent as affordable tied to income threshold. It is all kinds of things in the background like it can't exceed 60 percent ami there's all kind of pieces to so it. basically asking not asking like making forcing so, so be, let's clarify forcing a developer 20 percent of the development let, would be affordable let's clarify this um so um that you were still allowed to do by right right whichever yeah. that might be on that but if you want to do a subdivision if you want to 10 rezone, units or more it's it, and if it's over 10 units or more then you're you're required to do all this stuff and and to ned's credit he kind of stopped everything and said we're this is just overwhelming we need to bring folks into the table so the regional housing partnership hopefully will be the the, the body to help do that because this the, is, I, the concept is no developer is going to move forward with a project that's 10 units or more if the developer is forced to earmark 20 percent of the project for it, it's not even the forced is the wrong word okay well right, it, mandated it, it, it back to the under what's that word Unintended consequences? Unintended. <clears throat> I want to back you up. There's a lot of intended consequences in the proposed regulation. Correct. The amount of oversight and fingers from the county in the private property in order to have an ADU is so exceedingly complicated yeah. and it's intrusive to me. Yeah. As, as to make it unwanted. There you go. <laughs> and so, <laughs> you know, when you have a really good idea that's going to be really helpful, and then you tack on a whole lot of, I can't use that word. I mean, I probably can because we're just streaming. But piss poor execution. You tack on a whole lot of crap yeah. and red tape. Um, you're little doing, ears. Little ears. You're doing to ADUs exactly what we've done to well housing permits all along. We've created too much issue, and suddenly the juice isn't worth the squeeze to the people that can actually make it a reality. So I'll I'll make it even simpler than that. As a recovering developer they will take the path of least resistance. Which is Green County. It, which, is, which is the surrounding counties. Yeah. Really, to be honest, it's not Fulvana, which by the way, on Monday we're gonna talk about this because on Wednesday they adopted their budget and adopted a 10 cents increase. So we're gonna, we're gonna, we're gonna talk about the impact. I mean, this straight up on could Mr. And Mrs. Halt Smith. development in Almar. Yeah, yeah, and, and, and so here's the, here's the good news. The good news is some board of supervisors realize that. The, Ned. The, well, the whole board realized okay. that after Ned discussed it. Um, and, they're, and they've directed staff to go out and create an actual work session. So that's a good news. So that means we're going to get another bite at this apple. I'll be frank with you. My concern is, is this has been going on for two years. I've been doing this for a long time. They get into fatigue, right? And sometimes things just get adopted to move on. The good news is Ned stood up. And, and, and if, if you go back and watch, watch what he said, it was pretty, pretty, pretty awesome. And everybody on the board agreed that, look, we need to do this. So I don't want to hit the panic button, but there's an there is an ability for this to clean up what, what Quinton's outlined, kind of change. Actually, why not just throw the money in a pot? Just if you're going to do a new development. What do you mean by throw? I mean, I mean fee, f pay for affordable Just like, throw, throw if you're going to throw who's throwing the, money the developer. In the just instead yeah, of, I, instead I, I of can forcing. Assure, I can assure you that won't work. Why? 
because it hasn't worked in the past. I understand that, and I understand that's how they've done it. Maybe it's just the execution hasn't been great. Uh, well, the problem is, is if you make the number so high, we're right back to square one with a developer. So this is very detailed stuff. I would once the dates are set, it's a public meeting. Quentin needs to come up and talk. You need to come up and talk on it. Quentin needs to come up and talk. Is that, Ned even going to allow me after and the our Hawaiian conversation? Shirt. Oh, yeah, no. That's right. I that's, forgot that's about right. that. Yeah, yeah, Ned's yeah. already talking yeah, yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, I, that's I'm right. banned. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot I'm about banned. that whole... That whole. You know what puzzles me is, is I, I sort of feel a little bait and switch going on in municipalities. So we've been talking for many, many years about the 5% set aside for development and how it's been developed to the point where everything that's left is crap and it's so hard to develop that, again, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Within, within the 5%. Yes. Yeah. And instead of just saying, we're going to move 2% of it now, yeah, the, the, we're being handed this really complex, expensive, restrictive ADU plan. And I, 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 so, feel like, I feel like I'm being given the bad pill in the hot dog and told to gobble it down as though that's actually solving a problem. So uh, ADU is, is not auxiliary dwelling units. This is affordable dwelling units. One of the things I hopefully they change is the acronyms because it confuses people. This is basically how housing affordability is what yeah. Almal is trying to do. Housing affordability. <clears throat> and there is an enormous track record in our local municipalities as well as of across the it country up. of local government being the wrong person to do this. Amen, brother. They're, well, they need to partner with nonprofits and community organizations, or you end up with owners and residents that uh, don't really like <laughs> the housing that they've got. So There it uh, is. There it is. So that's happening. So the good news is the regional housing partnership is built exactly on that. I we have you. all the local governments, the nonprofits, the for profits, and the people who we serve, and all that is going to be at the table to go ahead and do, instead of this being done in a vacuum. That that to to your point, I can tell you, I, I honestly believe this. Maybe this is a little bit um, Pollyannic of me, but I am confident if we put everybody in the room, all the stakeholders in the room, we'll come up with something that I think is pretty good. You think? I really do. Okay. I really, I really believe that. I don't disagree. That. I think I really the trick then is pushing it through. To Excuse me. Pushing it through to completion so it's actually possible. Yeah. Um, so the number of of really good ideas that have died in local government is astonishing. Br brother, and I, I'm not trying to throw them under the bus. I know many of these people, and their hearts are in the right place, and they work really hard to do it, and they're really trying their best. It just it dies. I've been doing this for a very long time. You're 100% right. But it takes somebody or a group to push it through. And I honestly believe that we've got a good shot, good shot to do something with this. I honestly believe that. Um, otherwise, I wouldn't be putting all my time in it. So I honestly well, believe Well, and that. so much of the area is tied to what is happening in Albemarle. That's exactly right. I mean, Albemarle, in a lot of ways, is the driver because Charlottesville City is landlocked. There's no land left for Charlottesville really to develop. Almaro County, we've only used 5%, and of the 5%, we haven't even used it all. Yeah. So Almaro is the place, the government, the jurisdiction that can really lead the charge here. So, so, the, so the, the... And it's the biggest one. Absolutely uh, on it. But look, it, it, the reality of it is, if they don't figure out what the, what... The word incentive got lost in this conversation, Right. That's what they're trying to do. They're You're trying saying to, incentivize the developer. That's exactly right. Yeah. That's what this is supposed to be. Well, what they've done is that he, the opposite of an incentive. And they, until that board meeting, I don't think... They realized it. I don't think staff realized it. And you know why that is? <clears throat> they, don't, they don't... Because it's not business people. They don't... They, 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 because they're not in front of the regional housing partnership, which has the business people in it, has the nonprofits in it, has the government in it. So, um, I, I, you know, again, I may be Pollyannic and, and all this stuff. And you are. I am. Yeah. yeah. Oh, look at that. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Siri thinks so too. Siri wants to be on the show. <laughs> Siri is joining us in the discussion. Well, you know, one of the great things about being a, a, a Marine is I don't give up all that easy. So, I'm going to continue to fight. On it well, on this particular topic, you can't. I can't give up? No, you can't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, you can't. I won't. You I know mustn't. you won't. I mustn't. Yeah, you mustn't. Siri. Let's see what Siri says. 
What, what are you no, we're not going to talk to her anymore. We're not going to talk anymore. So what's that shirt? Tell, talk about your shirt. This is my fair housing yeah. shirt. It's uh, fair housing month. Uh, so talk about that. Why is that so important? Well, because we've done such a bad job of it up to now. <laughs> well, there you go. All right, next subject. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I would like to point out, you know, there's realtors as an association, as a trade group, is under a lot of fire at different levels for different reasons. And, <laughs> and I have my own opinions on that, and that's not relevant. What is relevant is of the many trade associations that exist, which we don't often know about, um, there has been a really good come to Jesus amongst the national, state, and local realtor associations to do everything possible to promote affordable housing, to promote equity in housing, and to really embrace fair housing training and enforcement across the entire association. <clears throat> um, even before the Long Island reports came out, which are the ones that most people yeah. reference, where mm -hmm. they had um, persons follow realtors around and video them and tape them and catch them in various, various egregious degrees of fair housing violation. Even before that was happening, there was uh, a move at the national level to create enforcement that, that came up with Fairhaven, which is a great training that really increased the amount of enforcement that can happen even outside of the government agencies and uh, a lot of training also on implicit bias, something that everybody in the world is subject to in some fashion or another and how to override that bias when you're working with clients so that everybody gets treated fairly and that if you have the wherewithal to purchase a home at any of the levels that we've been talking about, you don't get locked out of that because of a non-material issue. So um, one, of the gr one of the interesting things about Virginia, Virginia actually has some different classifications of, of fair housing than, than, the, than the feds do. And one of them is source of funds, which, which as a veteran, I get myself a little tweaked up well, as a disabled vet, to be honest. Go ahead. Here's your opportunity. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I, I, had a, uh, I had a client, a, a, a listing client, wanted to reject um, a, an offer because it was a VA loan. Um, and I asked him why. And he's, he says, well, for, for some, some other reasons. And I said, well... That's not going to happen because you're going to have to find yourself another real estate agent to help sell your home because yeah. I'm not going to be part of that on that end of it. You have to give me, is, is it uh, some fiscal reason why that isn't there just because you don't want to do it to a, to, for a veteran because it's a little bit more complicated to, to go through. Um, so I, I walked them off of that ledge and we actually ended up accepting that one for, it was actually a stronger offer financially and, and all that great stuff. But source of funds is, 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 is something new in our state. Um, do you want to give us a quick little education on that? Or? Well, I don't know that I know all the ins and outs of it, other than that no matter where, if I'm selling the house and I'm selling it as a commodity and I have a price point and I have some terms, once somebody checks all those boxes, it, it boggles the mind to think of other reasons people might pull in to say no to something that's really a good deal for them. And making that transaction really about the transaction mm -hmm. in these issues that we're talking about, I think is imperative for fair housing to be applied across the board. And you know, a lot of the things that, that we saw several years ago in some of the, the news articles that came out were much more egregious. Oh yeah, sure. <clears throat> and certainly, you know, bias of a level and type that that irks my soul on a level that's hard to convey. Hundred percent. Hundred percent. That begs the question, what is the future of your profession a generation from now? I, I'm really curious how that works because there's so much technology involved in owning and managing a home that creates opportunity for bias right. or discrimination and how we work around that. And I know <coughs> several of us who are brokers in the local area have had many conversations of, without waiting for the government, what can we do sure. to help work through these and remove the opportunity? And I think it's our obligation, both because of our fiduciary to the seller you can have a seller that um, maybe has cameras 
that could be accused of a fair housing violation that's not real, so you need to protect them. You also want to just remove the opportunity for it to happen. You know, the, the best way to prevent a mistake is to remove the opportunity for the mistake to happen. If the stove is off, nobody can get burned. There it is. And uh, so, love letters. Ah. I know. Well, Love letter, um, a buyer writing a letter through his or her representation to the seller of a home to influence their decision on picking them out of a crowded or competitive pool of buyers. Yeah. So Yvonne in Houston. Seems, I mean, the love letter thing seems... Seems like you should be able to. Yvonne do this. and her husband, Houston. She's not in Houston. That too. Yeah. Uh, there's a whole story behind that. Words be... matter. Yeah, keep going. <laughs> Thanks. You understand I have ADD, right? Oh, he knows. <laughs> he knows. He's it's one, one of the... the things that makes you fun to take to parties. <laughs> he is fun at parties. He's also one of the ones behind the scenes that nudges me and says, "Keep him on track, Jerry. Keep him on track." So, love letters. Yvonne wanted the right one. Your daughter. Uh, my daughter, who is now studying to be a real estate agent. Ooh. So I said, okay, I'll tell you what. I want you to write one, and then we're going to go over it. And all the words that she put in, sentences she put in there, that violates fair housing, that violates fair housing, that violates fair housing. And when we took all those letters out there. There it was, was nothing left. There was, was like, it? I want to buy a house, yeah. <laughs> right? Sincerely, <Yeah>. Avon. <laughs> I want to buy a house. <laughs> Please sell me your house, yeah. right? So, you know, talk about unbiased, right? And, and Yvonne is a school teacher, very progressive. Oh, yeah. You know, she is very, she, she's constantly teaching Smith. Right. Me, how to use the right words. She's failing miserably, but trying to use the right words. Use the right words. Use the right words on that end of it. And I said, look, these are all the things you just... And she was shocked because she thought she was doing the right thing. Love letters are a bad idea. They cross a line, can easily cross a line. It should be as exactly as Quentin said. This is how much I'm offering. Here's my terms. Here's my condition on mm. it. Well, and let's, let's, you know, and if we step back a little bit, why is a buyer, a, the generic buyer, why is a generic buyer writing a love letter? Because they're desperate. And in that desperation, they want to add one more intangible that makes them better than the That's other exactly. person who came off. Stand out. They want to somehow be more valuable to the seller on the basis of things that have nothing to do with the transaction so. and bring no other value to the sale. And... That in and of itself is the wrong way to approach it and can often distract you from the things that could actually make you win. You also have an equal opportunity to say something in the letter that the seller hates and ruin your odds. And you have to make it about the math. You have to make it about the terms of the contract. Everything else is sort of hedge doctor voodoo. Pomp and circumstance. And, so, and, so it, and, it, and it doesn't serve the buyer that wants to write the letter any more that it serves the seller that wants to be unfair. So there back that, back's how we go. won our 13th offer. I had 13 conversations with 13 listing agents and asked all the leading W questions, you know, who, what, when, where, and why, and all this stuff, and actually went back, okay, great, you've listed it at 450 or whatever it was. Please tell me your rationale why you did that. Give me your comps for it. And we ended up having a, a, a very in-depth conversation. And not to blow sunshine you know, over me here, but I was going to say something else, but then I realized I that know. would be inappropriate. <laughs> you were just telling me, little ears. Yeah, little yeah, ears. yeah, yeah, yeah. Then I realized I said little ears. So, so, but in any event, uh, uh, every one of those agents said, nobody's ever picked up the phone and done that. So tell me how you got to 450, because that's not what I'm seeing. And, and it made the difference in this one, this one transaction. It really did. We, we provided. I'm, I'm genuinely very happy for your, your family and for your daughter and your family. I know this was a uh, roller coaster ride. Well, it's an emotional roller coaster ride for the agents that are watching. It's just for us, too. No doubt. And, and throwing the father piece and, and the parent piece and the grandfather piece, too. What? <laughs> 
<laughs> you had a lot. I just saying you had yeah, a lot I, invested. I, yeah, I, I, I focused on. I know that. Helping but come as, on. As you, I, 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 I appreciate your professionalism, but we cannot discount the fact that you were representing your daughter. Well, and maybe your the house that they won has a master bedroom on the first floor. There you go. The there you it go. It might have one. What <laughs> does your daughter not know about this house that benefits Keith? Talk what? about personal bias. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> didn't, she, didn't she put the offer in sight unseen? Oh, yeah, sure. Because only you have been in this home. Well, they've been virtually in the home. Yeah, but only you physically have been in this home. So, so, so the extent of what she's seen is where you've pointed the camera. And I may have focused on That's what I'm that. saying. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> well, then again, I might not have. So, so number six on the slides, the right number team. Number six. Right who is on the other side matters. This agent that we're working with is super professional, uh, very responsive. I mean, just been a pleasure to work with up and up until this point. But so I called her yesterday and I said, look, you know, we're under contract. I didn't want to have this conversation with you until it's done. We're under contract. So the kids are flying in on a weekend. We're going to actually see our house and do our final walkthrough at the same time. I said, look, I know your client's trying to do whatever. Can you give us an hour, right? And she was very gracious and said, yes, we're going to go ahead and do this. So actually the kids are going to fly over, take a look at the house. We're going to do our final walkthrough um, and, then, and then close and close on it. So, Congratulations, my yeah. friend. I'm very uh, impressed with how you've managed this. Well, well, it's what we do every day. I know. You look forward to it. We look forward to it. I do. Quinn Beckham, for the viewers and listeners, maybe some closing thoughts. Uh, one, I really need a haircut. And you only notice these things when you go on a camera and you can see yourself. So, you know, don't, don't get a haircut and don't drive around with the windows rolled down. Um, things are, are looking brighter. I would encourage people to stay participatory in your local government and really reach out to people if you're looking for a home like Scott Morris, the gentleman sitting next to me, Katie Pearl, Explore those options before you read the news and give up because the, the news is interested in getting clicks and you need somebody that's interested in you. There you go. There you go. Keith Smith. Trusted advisors matter, man. They, they really do. They, the, the, these folks that do this for a living um, you know, bring a ton of knowledge to the table. Get them to your kitchen table and they'll help you navigate it. Keith Smith, Yes Realty Partners. Keller Williams Alliance, Quentin Beckham, Keller Williams Alliance, Judah Wickhauer, he's the director. My name is Jerry Miller. This is Real Talk with Keith Smith. The show is archived at realtalkwithkeithsmith.com, along with all the sizzle reels we cut. If you click the Partners tab on realtalkwithkeithsmith.com, you will find folks we suggest that you work alongside, trusted advisors. The I Love Siebel show is up in one hour and four minutes. Thank you kindly for joining us. Take care. Thank you, gentlemen. Excellent. I've been here in forever. Make a host job easy, man. That isn't because I have.